Seed is a really crucial input for microgreens production. And what we're going to present to you here is a two-part video series taking a look at seed from the supplier perspective. Now, in our online course on Teachable, we talk a lot about seed, uh, how to source quality seed, uh, what quality seed looks like. But in this two-part series, we're going to take a look deeper at what it looks like from the supplier perspective. And that's important in terms of giving you a sense of the reality of the seed world. It also gives you much more information and much more insight as a microgreens grower and gives you more tools to help you know, run a successful business. Uh, the reason we wanted to put this video series together was that there is a lot of misinformation out there about seeds and there's a lot of incomplete information out there about seeds. And in, in, in fact, you really cannot grow a good microgreens crop without good seed. You can take good seed and grow a very bad crop quite easily. Uh, but in terms of starting with bad seed and producing a good crop, it's very, very difficult. So the hope here is that by looking at things from the supplier perspective uh, and thinking about the bigger picture of seed, you will get a, a better understanding of seed in general, and this will help you with developing management strategies for, for your business and for your seed. So in the first video, uh, I'll be talking with Diego Footer of Farm Small Farm Smart, uh, who we've been doing a long time microgreens podcast with. Uh, and we'll talk about uh, you know seed, uh, seed topics we've talked about before. And then in our second uh, video, we actually shift over and we have a wonderful interview with Lisa Mum of Mum's Sprouting Seeds based in Saskatchewan, Canada. And as a longtime sprout and microgreen seed supplier, uh, Lisa offers a lot of insights into what seed looks like on her end in terms of getting that seed grown uh, into their warehouse and out to you uh, as a customer. And I think that perspective is really valuable, especially for those of you who are running a microgreens business. So uh, I hope you enjoy and let's get on with the videos. So Chris, today we're talking on something that we've touched on a lot in the past, and it's the importance of seed. And I think a lot of microgreen growers, they hear about seed and they think, you know, I just got to buy seed. And they don't spend a lot of time really thinking about who they're sourcing it from, where it's coming from. They don't look into quality, yet it's a crucial ingredient if you're growing microgreens. It's, it's one of your main inputs outside of soil. Why did you feel it was so important to talk seed again when we've touched on it in the past? Well, at a basic level, um, if you don't have good seed, you can't grow good microgreens. So that's the basic basic uh, foundation there. Uh, uh, even though if you have good seed, it's very hard to grow. It's very easy to grow bad microgreens, but that's another topic altogether. And, and with seed, you're not just thinking about your varieties and how fast they grow. When we talk about microgreens, we're also really interested in the uh, hygienic quality of the seeds. And this is just an aspect of seed that we want to consider to avoid human pathogens in our uh, production systems. And this really grows out of the Canadian context where sprouts and microgreens are kind of lumped together. Uh, in the U.S., it is a little different. Uh, microgreens are considered covered produce, so kind of like being grown in a greenhouse. Uh, but what sprouts and microgreens have in common is you're growing a high density of seeds in optimum conditions for pathogen growth. And so the conditions that grow pathogens are the same conditions that are really good for growing microgreens. And so as a, as a longtime microgreens grower and, and a sprout grower as well, I know it's really important to start out with good clean seed. And that, that clean seed actually starts out before the seed crop is even planted. With a farmer using good agricultural practices, the microgreen seed supplier uh, having a contract with the farmer or sourcing good seed on the commodity markets, testing that seed themselves. And so there's already multiple steps in place before that seed gets to the grower to ensure it's going to be pathogen free. So that's some stuff I think that really gets overlooked when think people are often thinking about what's a good price of seed and who has good quantities and who has these varieties. Those are important, uh, but if those if those seeds aren't of good quality and, and coming uh, pathogen free, then they're not really the seeds you want to be using in a commercial system. Yeah, I think this is something that really gets paid attention to in a lot of other industries. Like right now, we're in the process of getting our house painted, 
and all the painters use a couple brands, Sherwin Williams or Dunn Edwards down here. They're not going to Home Depot to buy paint. They're not going to the hardware store to buy paint. And you could say, well, that paint at hardware stores, it's great. They sell exterior paint, but there's a reason maybe that the professionals don't use it. There's a lot of warranties and such when it comes to these better paints that are sourced from more commercial sources. When you think about seeds, how does that landscape look? In your experience from your growing, from talking to people and just knowing the seed industry really well, is there a big difference between high quality seed and average seed? I don't wanna say the worst seed, but high quality seed from a great supplier and then just seed that you could get somewhere. Yeah, well, I think with everything uh, and the way you laid out, there's a spectrum. There's the best seed and there's the worst seed. So the best seed is going to be, you know, uh, a well-sourced seed, pathogen tested, grows well, germinates well, uniform growth, all these things. And then the worst seed, and just to use the, the obvious example for, for me, is uh, sunflower seed that's bird seed. And, and this is something you see a lot like, oh, why can't I just use bird seed to grow my microgreens? And so, so let we, you should look at seed as a continuum of quality from very bad to very good. And uh, I think companies in general are going to have a bit of a spectrum as well, from hopefully from very good to pretty good seed. Every once in a while, you're going to see a company that's carrying not great seed. And over time, you're going to learn which companies constantly carry good seed. And I think that the, the, the companies that specialize in sprouting and microgreen seed are really mindful about that because there's a level of liability there for them and there's a level of, of quality assurance and there's a level of reputation. So this kind of comes into, uh, you know, you want to get a sense of, of who the companies are that are out there. You want to get a sense of, of which ones are more consistently uh, providing uh, the best seed. And a lot of this can be word of mouth, talking to other people, getting their experience. And then, of course, you want your own experience with that as well, about how consistent that seed is. And I think even people who have their favorite seed supplier still sometimes get seed that isn't may maybe their favorite. You know, I, I think back over the years of having super awesome lots of of sunflower or pea seed and then other lots that just aren't maturing right. And, you know, they're pathogen tested and they're, they're germ tested and they're all meeting the standards, but something isn't quite the ideal of what I want it to be. But it's rare from the suppliers I've used that I get seed that's like, you know, this, is, this isn't even growable. And if I did, I would, I would call that supplier and I would say, hey, you know, as a long time buyer, th this seed is not appropriate. Um, one, can you tell me a little bit about it? Two, can you tell me a little bit about what other feedback you're getting from people? And three, I would say like, well, here's the different things we've tried because we know sometimes you need to adopt your system when you get a, a new lot of seed in and these things haven't worked. And, and at that point, I expect very much that a, a reputable company is going to go, you know what, if this seat's not working for you, then we're going to give you a credit or, or refund you your money. So, so a lot of that is, is knowing what's out there and, and, uh, and doing your homework. The other piece is building uh, a relationship with your seed supplier. And uh, I've worked with, uh, you know, companies as microgreen seed suppliers and as vegetable seed suppliers with many different hats on. And so over the years, I think, one, I've built these relationships. And two, I know what questions to ask. I know who to talk to. Um, you just learn these things, right? And so um, that relationship building is a big part of it. So yeah, one is doing your homework. Two is is using the seed and 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 keeping track of that. And then three is building that relationship with your with your suppliers. Yeah, and in terms of quality suppliers, one person that we'll be talking to as a follow up to this one is Lisa Mum, one of the people involved in Mum Seeds. And when it comes to suppliers like Mums. What has been your experience of building that relationship to them? I think today we've kind of been spoiled by Amazon, and this is, applies to a lot of things, where you place an order online, it's kind of faceless. They do have great customer service, but you're more buying from the page, buying off the picture, buying off the description. You're not calling someone up, asking questions about it, really getting into the nitty gritty. With Paper Paco, I mean, I get calls all the time and I'll take time to kind of walk people through it. What are you doing? What's your situation? And there is that hand-holding side that helps people make the right choice. 
So you have online where on one hand, it's easy and convenient for a retailer to put that up and do it. It's easy for us to buy. And on the other hand, you still do have the personal side of business to things. So when you've reached out to companies to find out about seed, to source seed, what have been your experiences? Yeah, so so my my experience with mums as as an example started off when I was like a lot of people growing sprouts in jars, you know, 25 years ago. And, you know, I would just order from the website or actually probably back then you probably I might have had to call an order. Um and then when I started getting into commercial production, um, you know, you like the volumes of seed we buy for commercial production aren't even listed on the website. You actually have to call to make those orders. And we had a sort of set number of crops we worked with. We knew what uh, good growth in those crops looked like. And we knew the questions to ask when we called about those. So I would... I would have, uh, you know, we would buy maybe, let's just say, a thousand kilograms of seed, so a hundred bags, that would last us a certain amount of time. And as we got down to about, you know, two hundred kilograms of seed, I'm calling up moms and saying, "Hey, you know, we're getting prepared for our next lot of seed. Uh, what have you got in stock?" So I'm always thinking about seed in terms of lots. Now, a lot number generally tells you like uh, when it was produced, what country it was produced in, and all the seed within a lot is going to be very much the same. All, all, all of lot uh, SF8 uh, or SF8F from Italy is all going to be pretty much the same seed. SF8C from Italy is going to be different seed. So, so, so those lot numbers are really important. And so we've got a s supply of seed. We're calling to get more information about the next seed. And I'm asking questions. Hey, how do you guys feel about these latest lots of seed? What does the germination rate look like? How do you think it compares to this rate? And 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 for, for in the early years, I, I remember actually talking with Lisa, mom's mother, uh, her parents had started the business. And then over time, Lisa took over. And yeah, like these were conversations that weren't I never felt were a burden uh, on, on, on Lisa's part or anyone's part. It was part of their job of being a good seed supplier uh, to make sure that we had the information we needed to make a good purchase because that's in their best interest. Oh, you've got three different lots. You've got one from Italy, one from Canada, one from the U.S. So I would ask, well, what does the seed sizing look like in each of those? What does the seed uniformity look like? You know, tell me about your testing. What about the debris that's showing up in the in the bags? And, and and I would uh, I would know very quickly, you know, what what to ask and, and could get to a, to a sense. But then even then be like, OK, well, send me 10 kilograms of each because we're going to trial each of them anyways. Yeah. I'm pretty sure seed A is going to be the one we want, but we still need to do our own due diligence. And so seed A is our preferred, C is our second and B is our third based on this conversation. Now we need to grow this out in our system to test that. Mums has their own system of testing. Uh, other microgreens companies are growing in different conditions. And I've had it where I'm like, hey, we're not really happy with this seed. What kind of feedback are you getting? And, and, and sometimes they're saying, actually, some of the growers are saying this is the best seed they've ever had. So and, and, where, and where I've been like, oh, my God, I love that seed. They're like, oh, yeah, we've had a lot of complaints about that. So it's just one of those things. You, you, there's no rules. And because each system is so different in terms of growing media, temperature, airflow, lighting, watering methods, uh, you know, seeding rates. Um, you just have to really do that, spend that time with the company to get that information. And hopefully those conversations you're having are benefiting the company as well because they're knowing the stuff that their their growers are looking for. Right. If you think about the continuum of, of microgreen growers, people get into it to just start in jars or growing on a home scale up through people who really expand a business, employing dozens of people, you know, putting out thousands of trays a week. Where do you think it's realistic that somebody should really think about forming this relationship and really digging into their seed? I think you could say, hey, from day one. But we all know, like, that's great advice, but not everybody's going to do that. Where do you think it really makes a difference, both in terms of production and where you're starting to risk, you know, it really hitting the bottom line if things don't work well, if you don't make the right decision? Knowing a lot of growers and, again, grow, having grown yourself a lot in the past— at what stage of a grower do you say like, okay, this is something now we really have to pay attention to this because this can change our lives? 
Well, I think at any commercial scale, you need to have that relationship. And if we've talked about this before, if you're at a commercial scale, you kind of need to be at a minimum scale anyways to be to be making that a viable operation. So as soon as you're selling product for money, well, that's really important because what you're doing is you're taking something you're growing and you're selling it to the public, you're selling it to strangers. And so that level of accountability and liability and responsibility is a lot higher, especially when it comes to quality of product, uh, potential pathogens, things like that. Um, but even as a home scale grower, you know, and even I, if I'm just growing, you know, a little bit of something, I'm just going to point and click an order from mum's website or from high mowing's website. I don't need to talk to anybody. But if I get that seed and it's not really good, it's like I'm sending an email. It's like, hey, I'm a longtime customer. I bought this. I just bought, you know, 700 grams. But just to, you know, like, you know, I've grown a lot of this. It's not germinating particularly well. And, and it's one of those things where, where as a seed company, you're doing an assessment as well. And you're like, OK, well, we, we, we did uh, our internal testing. And it worked well here. The general feedback we're getting is pretty good overall. Um, and, uh, you know, so maybe there's something up with this grower. So you have the conversation to try and suss that out. Tell us about your growing conditions. Well, it sounds like maybe you're overwatering and you're doing this. Can you try this first? Because the general feedback we're getting is that it's good seed. Or you're, also, or you're saying, you know what, we understand we've had this feedback a lot, we did our trials, but maybe there's something we've missed, we're happy to give you a credit or a refund. And that's one of those things where if you've got a seed supplier you're, you're, you're confident in, you're not looking to take them down or get your money back or write a bad review. You just want to make sure the money you're spending is being well used and that seed supplier wants you to come back. So they're happy to give you that credit because they want your business in the future, potentially for years, potentially for decades. So crediting a, you know, a 10 or 20 or $100 order to get thousands more dollars in orders over the future is a very easy decision for a company to make, right. I hope. Yeah, and if you think about where ag tech has came over the past 20 years, we've came a long way. And, and I'm thinking, and you can tell me if this is wrong, that production methods have came a long way when it comes to producing seeds where they can kind of, they're, they're a lot better at growing seeds now than they were in the past. And you can kind of get a consistent product. Obviously, there's natural variables in there that can change things. And this isn't targeted at any one company. But do you think that there are companies that maybe can't pay as much attention to all types of seeds because they just sell so much. I look at some of these companies and they have thousands and thousands of SKUs and they might do some basic germination testing. But beyond that, I mean, how well do they really know each of those crops? And that's one reason we don't sell a lot of products is because I don't like to sell a lot of things I don't know a lot about. And the more products you add, the harder it is to know about them and how they perform and every little nuance about them. Do you have you had experiences in the past where you feel like when you have had questions, you're not getting the answers that you really need because potentially that knowledge is so diluted out by the number of products being sold? Or is the industry so good at producing seeds now? More or less, if you buy from any reputable seed supplier in, say, North America, you're going to get good stuff out of the box. Um, that, that's a, a good question. It's a, a, it's, it's, there's, a lot of, uh, there's a lot of variables to consider. Um, when I think of someone like Mums, uh, it's a very narrow – I can't take this. I'm in the middle. Sorry. It's going to melt. I'm in a meeting. I'm recording this meeting. I'm live. Thanks. <laughs> okay. Gonna have to do some editing there. It was my son attempting to be loving. <laughs> oh, that's okay. Um, so it, it is a complex question, and it's complex because the world of seed is complex. Now, you, you've got all these different scenarios, and I'll try not to be too long winded here, but when we think of seed companies, uh, when we think of a, a company like it varies between companies, but but if we think of a company like Mums or Johnny's or High Mowing, um, a company like uh, like Mums is buying a lot of seed on on the open market, is contracting farmers to grow specific things, and I think Mums maybe actually be growing some of their own seed. They're in the prairies and they can do that. Other companies they just sell other people's seeds. They are just brokers. 
And so they're relying a lot on the broker information. They're also relying on the suppliers, whether it's like Vitalis or Seminus, these different seed companies that are, that are uh, developing the seeds and then contracting out the growing of the seeds. There's many different layers of, of the seed industry. It's, it's fascinating and complex. And so part of your, your uh, duties as a company supplying seeds to the public is to do a bunch of screening ahead of time, try and have the best suppliers. And every once in a while, you're going to see a deal that maybe seems too good to be true, but is also too good to pass up. You know, you, you look at the specs and the germ rate looks good and it tests well. But then you realize, you know, um, like I remember with a red daikon radish where it turned out like 30 percent of the, 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 the daikon was green. And they were like, before I even bought it, I was talking to mom. So like, just before you, so you know, like before you buy this, this one has a lower rate. And we've lowered the price on that because we know you're buying this to get that red product. Um, and so generally I find um, if I need that information, it's there. Um Companies like Mums don't actually carry that many types of seed. I've seen the companies that do sell hundreds to thousands. And a lot of the vegetable seed companies, they'll carry anywhere from sort of 700 to 1,000 varieties. And those companies are often trialing those seeds every year. Johnny's does lots of microgreens trials. I know Mums is doing that. So you are, in a, in a way, counting on others, uh, on the companies doing that. Another thing we're seeing now is is we know this peer-to-peer -peer sharing. It's, it's what we're doing essentially with, with this podcast and the stuff we do. You see in the forums all the time, like, hey, and I've seen this, like I have this lot of seed from this company. This is what I'm seeing, what kind of results are others getting? And that's really good because it's unfiltered. Um, you, you can read reviews sometimes on websites about the seed. So there's a lot of mechanisms out there. Now, if I call a seed company and on more than two occasions I'm getting uh, evasive or not very good answers, um, chances are I'm going to stop buying from that seed company. And this is after, you know, you know, decades of, of doing this kind of work, working really careful, w carefully with a lot of seed growers and breeders and, and academics in the realm of seed. Um, I just know what I want really well. And, and it kind of goes back to the earlier question you, you, you asked is like, for a lot of people, they don't have enough information or a big enough volume of seed purchasing to be asking this stuff or even care. Because one of the reasons I'm asking a lot of these questions myself is because I'm intentionally holding these companies to account. Hey, I really know what's going on with seed. Your seed isn't measuring up. How are you going to respond to this? By the way, you know, this is something, you know, I talk about in, in these public forums and I do it in it, try to do it in a diplomatic and non-threatening way. But the reality is we live in a very public world right now for businesses. And yeah, I, I want, I, I, I buy from you because I think you're a reputable supplier. I want to continue to buy from you because you do good stuff. Are you going to meet me there and continue to do that? And like I said, that's generally the case. It's rare that I'm getting in touch with a company and they're like, sorry, can't help you. Or, you know, talk to Bob in, in quality control and Bob sends you off to Janet and in, in, in uh, customer, you know, you just get thrown around. I just don't yeah. see that happening in the seed industry that much. One thing I was talking to Eric Schultz about the other day was like this idea of, of kind of general rules. And sometimes with one negative about farming now is there's almost too much knowledge. And obviously context is important. If you're growing in Tennessee versus Olympia, Washington versus Maine, things are going to be different. But if you try and simplify down and kind of remove context, are there some basic things that you want to see when you're buying quality seed, kind of regardless of seed type, regardless of where you are in the world, regardless of the volume you're buying, are like these, this is the bullet point list of this is how I define quality microgreen seed. Yeah, so first off the bat, it, ironically, is when that seed comes, it has a country of origin on it. Um, it has a lot number on it. That, that, that's an identifier. And so if I call and I have issues, I can tell you exactly that seed or and that stuff's required because if I do if we do some internal pathogen testing and, and stuff continually comes back 
you know, positive for something that shouldn't be there, that's why that lot number is there. Is, is so there's some tracing. So I look for that. If I get seed that doesn't have a country of origin or lot number on it, I'm like, oh, okay, well, this isn't very professional. These are just fairly standard things with a lot of these companies. And uh, in terms of seed itself, one is, is germination rate. You know, if I'm if I'm getting something uh, that's 70 percent germination rate, that means 30 percent of the seeds I sow are just sitting on the soil surface. That is a growing medium medium for all sorts of things. Not so worried about human pathogens there, but potentially plant pathogens and just uh, surface uh, uh, growth that may impede a general uh, microgreens growth. Uh, seed uniformity in size. I don't want big seed and small seed because generally big seed grows fast and small seed grows sm slow. And when I'm trying to harvest those big seed, the small seed aren't mature yet. And so you're getting more hulls, you're getting smaller, smaller uh, microgreens in there. Um, I want rapid growth um, or reasonably rapid growth. Uh, I want stuff to grow within an expected timeline. Uh, I don't want stuff to be growing faster or slower, even if it's the same size seed. I want clean seed. I don't want lots of sticks and debris and dust and stuff in the seed, which is something I rarely see. Um, though my favorite seed over the years, my favorite sunflower seed, uh, the stuff that we get from Manitoba here in Canada, always had a little bit more debris in the in the bags than I was comfortable with. But we never had any problems from that surface debris, which was one thing. Uh, two, the seed was very big and produced a nice microgreen. And three, it was vigorous and, and uniform and, and growth. So it met all the other growth requirements and that debris did not impede things as, as it could. So we were able to overlook that. Um, so those would be the, the main things. And then, and then uh, you know, adding on to that would be price. You know, am I paying a ridiculous price for this seed or is it reasonably priced with, with everything else that's on there on the market? Yeah. Let's say you're not certified organic and you didn't care. Have you ever noticed the difference in production between certified organic seed and conventional seed? Just a personal curiosity here. Uh, now, the, here's an interesting story. Um, so when I did my first year of production, um, I don't know why. I, I, I think when I was trying to source seeds from mums, I just wasn't happy with what they had. So I just I searched and searched and searched and I found this company in North Dakota or South Dakota I can't remember which now called Seeds 2000 and right away Seeds 2000 I'm like okay um, not the best <laughs> branding name and I got in touch and they're like yeah we we have some sunflower seed we have some black oil uh, it's a hybrid seed and it's 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 from it's from a cancelled order we wouldn't usually have this but somebody put it on order we've got like a pallet load of it i can sell to you at a good price um and here's what's interesting about the seed it, is it was um herbicide resistant and i'm like okay well is this genetically modified and they came back and said well no you know as far as we know there's no genetically modified sunflower on the market this is actually a case where uh, a farmer or a breeder, I can't remember, noticed a standalone sunflower in a field of soy that had been sprayed multiple times with Roundup. The sunflower didn't die. They knew very well what that meant. They saved that seed and bred from it. And so they naturally bred that, that herbicide tolerance in, as we hear about in, in wild, wild weeds and, and weed relatives. So that was my first seed. It was this black oil hybrid seed, and I have never seen a seed grow that well in my life um you know eight days of growth in those trays i was getting two kilograms of, of seed there so that's about four and a half pounds of, of sunflower per tray which is just off the charts um, and so that's a conventional hybrid seed now most of the time that seed isn't really going to be the seed you're looking for um, hybrid seed is generally going to a, a different market and a lot of the seed out there is going into into oil markets the the, the the certified organic market is still relatively small, so it can be tougher to find stuff, which means in the conventional market, you actually probably still are likely to find seeds that may perform better. However, because they're seed crops and they're not grown for human consumption, there is a much higher risk in some of those crops of more pesticide residue, unless they're being grown under contract specifically for microgreens, where these things are considered and they're using good agricultural practices to avoid that. Yeah, it's kind of an interesting niche thinking about this and having talked to several seed breeders last year for the podcast of hearing about that vigor 
and then breeding out specific microgreen seeds for that vigor. I realize it's a very small market compared to just the oil seed market, but I, I wonder if there isn't a niche there or even something that couldn't be done on a small scale. You see one tray and, uh, you know, if you're planting this many trays, 100 kilograms of sunflower, are there some trays that just grow faster than others? Maybe let those grow out, maybe start breeding those out a small dent in things, but you know, all things start small. Uh, I love closed loop systems. I love the idea of self-reliance. Um, we order food peddlers orders, uh, uh, sunflower seeds by the pallet load. Bigger companies order seeds by the semi load. It takes a lot of land to grow that seed. It takes very specialized equipment to harvest that seed and to prevent it from being contaminated in that process. Um, it was interesting what you said earlier about where we are at with seed technology. Um, there's been some really great seed growing techniques for, for many, many decades, you know, hundreds of years, really. And so and, and some of the machines we use now to process seeds, some are like lasers, laser accurate, and it's amazing. And others are still the same design that you see from uh, from 150 years ago. It's incredible. Um, but uh, I lost my train of thought there. Um, what was the original well, question? Well, breeding out on a small scale, <laughs> yes. great in theory, yeah. but technically very challenging. Yeah, so so it's it's hard for me. So so breeders breed for the market, you know, and there's not a big certified organic market, so people aren't even growing, breed, doing a lot of breeding for certified organic conditions unless that's their mandate. You know, carrot breeders breed for the packaged carrot market and, and the processed carrot market because that's who's buying the seed. Now, microgreen seed uh, purchasers are small, so so the the in order to recoup the breeding costs, it'd be very hard to do that. I think within the microgreens world, however microgreens production has a similar desired characteristics as other crops and that is fast germination now when you think about vegetable crops and you've talk, probably talked about this with others in your in your podcasts one of the things that makes a vegetable crop um uh, resilient to weed pressure is being able to grow up really quickly, outgrow the weeds, create a canopy, shade out the sun so 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 uh, the weeds can't get established. And so if you've got something that germinates fast and grows vigorously um, and you're breeding for that in your vegetables, that same trait is going to benefit you with microgreens. Um, so there's that aspect. And then the other aspect is hybridiza hybridization. So when you cross pollinate two inbred parents, and we don't need to get into the detail of this, one of the outcomes there is, is, is heterosis or hybrid vigor, where, where hybrid seeds are known to grow more vigorously and more uniformly. And that's why when you're using hybrids on a commercial scale, they all mature at the same time, so you can harvest it with a machine. And if you're harvesting, if you're growing microgreens with a hybrid, you get a very uniform germination, very uniform growth. So those characteristics that exist in vegetable crops also meet the needs of microgreens growers. So I, I don't think there'd be a real big case for breeding specifically for microgreens uh, in, that, in that regard. When you think about this vigor, is there a difference between some of the microgreen crops out there? If you just look at a specific crop, say sunflower, you know, I go to pick up a Johnny's catalog, a high mowing catalog. I'm going to see like black oil sunflower. There aren't choices there. Maybe there's organic, maybe there's not, but I'm not getting choices between A, B and C types. Are there subtypes under there that might have more vigor than others? And is there any way to suss that out? Maybe that's a question for Lisa Mum, or are you just taking what you can get and it's black oil sunflower or nothing? Uh, that's an interesting example because I've never seen a variety of black oil sunflower. It's just black oil sunflower. Um, I'm sure there's varieties out there. Um, but if you take a crop like buckwheat worldwide, there's like five main varieties of buckwheat and that's about it. Um, but I think you know from our microgreens growers know from growing um, different types of beets, Kyosha beets or bull's blood beets or, or something else or all the different types of radish. Um, so there are varietal differences in there, which people are often growing for spiciness, leaf shape, uh, vigor, uh, disease resistance, color of leaf. 
So some stuff, there's a lot of varieties, especially in the brassicas. There's this whole mustard family. There's hundreds and hundreds which have some variation. But in some crops, yeah, it's it's that it's 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 speckled pea. It's black oil sunflower. But it, it's going to be different depending on the farm that grew it, where it was grown. Somebody somewhere probably has some varietal information, but usually by the time it gets to the consumer, uh, that's lost. And that that would be a great question to ask Lisa. You know, one thing you mentioned you want to see is high germination rate. And some crops just inherently don't have a high germination rate. Sometimes you see it on the packages, you know, low germination rate during testing. We've overpacked this pack for you. Are there certain crops that you've grown in the past for microgreens that they inherently they just have a lower germination rate? And if you want to grow them, you just got to deal with that rate. Um, I've not had that experience. You know, I've grown 20, 25 different crops. Uh, I, I'm not one of these, like, grow as many different crops as you as you can type. Um, I find, like, kind of like the seed company trying to manage a thousand varieties. I don't want to manage 50 different crops. Uh, that, at the small scale, that doesn't make a lot of sense to me. Um, but people I, I see in a lot of the forums, people are always asking, like, can I grow this into a microgreen or that into a microgreen? And a part of that is, hey, there's this big market out there, and if nobody's growing this crop, well, what a great opportunity to be the only one that's carrying, you know, uh, amaranth or, or carrot or something. And some of these varieties will have lower rates. Uh, carrot's one that can have a, a lower germination rate. And yeah, what you, what you have to learn there is what what you, 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 through trial and error, learn what your optimum seeding rate is, but you want to keep an eye on that. It's like, okay, I usually get carrots at 70% germination rate. I can deal with that oh, this lot has 60%. So how am I going to deal with that? Or this this lot has 80%, it's better. So you're going to have to make those uh, changes. So um, I've not experienced that a lot. I've not seen that um, come back a lot either. And when I see posts on the forums about microgreens, about stuff that's not germinating well, when I look at pictures and, and, and see their conditions, it's usually a, a grower error. Uh, too too long of a soaking time or not enough soaking time or too humid or soil was too moist. There's usually growing conditions that account for the, those uh, poor germination rates. So if you think about poor growing conditions or maybe just some natural stuff that comes up like, like disease, that they account for a lot of problems within microgreen growing systems. Can you think of some specific problems that a grower might see that you could say, if you're seeing this, I would really look at your seed because I think it's a seed issue, not an environment issue, not a soil issue, not a grower issue. Like, are there certain problems that when they show up, the first thing that you would look at would be seed? Yeah. So the first question I ask, um, uh, cause it's, 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 these are the sort of inquiries uh, I, I get over the years and see on forums. And the first question I ask a grower, whether it's poor germination or problems with soil or problems with growth overall is, what have you changed? And so it's really hard to know if a seed is doing well if you've never grown that seed before. If you grow it for the first time and it doesn't germinate well, well, maybe it's too warm or too cold because you don't know the exact conditions yet, or your soil's too wet, or you didn't soak the seed or you soaked it too long. That's, that's getting to know the seed. But if you've been growing something for many years and then you get a new lot of seed in and, and that all of a sudden that's not germinating well in the conditions that always work well, usually that's going to be a point towards the seed. So what you're looking for is a change in something you know to be fairly consistent that corresponds with the change you've made in your system. I've seen this with soil. Uh, and, and, and as recent as last year, I did a video series on this where I added more compost to my soil and I started seeing more mold. I took the compost away, the mold went away. Conclusion, adding more compost to a soil in my growing conditions increases mold. Keep, keep the, 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 the conditions that down. It's tricky with seed, and with seed is that you need to know if there's been a change um, because it might take you five or 10 or 20 trials to understand like, oh, it's not the seed. I just have to be very careful about water, get the exact temperature because this seed is sensitive. And that might be a natural characteristic of that seed. So yeah, looking for changes in something you know to be fairly consistent um, is probably the main thing. Um, yeah, other stuff is too hard to know without asking a whole other series of questions. Sure. You know, one thing you're really big on is pathogen testing when it comes to seed. When you think about 
this improved technology and, and even the old school technology when it comes to processing seeds, how much contamination potential is there for seeds to get contaminated with pathogens? Is it fairly likely, highly likely? And how important is that pathogen testing? I know you might want it from, say, SOP standpoint, and you want it to fall back on if there are problems. But if, let's say, poof, we don't care about that, is there enough risk of contamination that you would not buy a seed if it didn't have that testing? As a commercial grower, I would be pretty reluctant. And, and part of that is I'm so, as you know, like once you start doing something that's at, to a high standard, to go anything lower than that is very, very difficult. You know, once you start eating really nice chocolate, it's hard to eat a Kit Kat. Right. It's almost impossible, actually. And so early, actually right from the beginning days of growing microgreens, like my microgreens operation in the beginning was a, a university directed studies project to see if at a small scale, I could meet CFIA standards. That was my project. And, and sourcing good seed was really a part of that. So I don't know anything but that. But in the bigger context, um, and you could say this is sort of fitting into the global context of where agricultural and food systems are, is you have no idea what's happening on the farm where that seed is growing. And it's also possible at the beginning of a season that a farmer doesn't know where that seed is going or the farmer expects that seed to go to one market and that market falls through. And then like, hey, actually, this microgreens company supply company is looking for a seed. This market fell out so I can sell it to them. I'm going to take a bit of a hit on the price, but, you know, we did a good job of handling it and it would still be suitable. It'll be um, a contingent on them testing the seed to make sure it's pathogen free. Now, we need to remember that um, we uh, it's not so much about the seed, the, this pathogen floating in from some random place. We use a lot of animal manures to, to fertilize our fields, to fertilize our soil, because a, a good growing system is all about healthy soil. And in a lot of systems, you're using uh, sewage waste, you're using human waste. And so uh, the, 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 the risk of a human pathogen being in human waste is much higher than it being in, in animal waste, though we know pathogens like E. coli are transferred from, from animals to human. Humans, they don't have an effect, the same effect on animals they have on humans. So what happens is you've got a field of sunflowers, they're being grown great, but they're being fertilized with manure. And so there's a risk of a pathogen from that manure ending up on that seed during the process. So when I talk about good agricultural practices uh, and knowing what the end market for a seed is, that farmer at all times is thinking, I need to handle my seed in a way that it doesn't get this contamination. If your market is bird seed or animal feed, you can, you know, we can let them get a little over mature. We can do them off the ground with this machine instead of that machine. It's fine. The weather's not great today. It'll be better in a couple of days. But when you're when you've got a, a sort of more of a high end market, you've got to be more particular. So that risk in some cases is 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 higher. I don't want to say relatively high, um, because there's a lot of standards in place for um, um, applying manure as well. You don't want to apply too close to harvest dates and all that stuff. But you've got these st steps of reassurance in place that start with the farmer's practices and growing the seed in the first place. So you buy that pathogen tested seed. So you feel good about it from that standpoint. What about taking that seed on board now, storing it, keeping it away from contamination, and then pathogen testing on your own? Is pathogen testing as a grower that has a seed stock standing there something that you think growers should be doing? And if so, how do you even do that? Yeah, so so we look at we look at the farmers growing the good agri agricultural practices line of defense one against pathogens. We look at the pathogen testing of the seed company as line of defense two. And I know I've talked to moms that said, "Yeah, we had a lot in, but we tested it and it came back with pathogens, so we're not taking it." So it's like great, like that's kind of it's too bad you've got a sunflower seed shortage, but I'm sure glad you didn't bring in the ones that tested positive for a pathogen. Um, that's a great way to ruin your business, to, to grow a crop that's going to make people sick. You, your, your next thing, and actually your next thing after that would be you need to 
you know, the seed is going to be shipped to you. Now, they are shipped in sealed bags, but there's possibility of contamination along the way, but it's probably not being shipped in a high contamination environment. Then I'm going to pick up that seed from a depot, often from a trucking depot directly, and I'm going to put it in my vehicle. Now, am I going to put it in the back of a pickup truck where I've just hauled a bunch of manure? Or am I going to put it in the back of a pickup truck where I've where I've actually sprayed it out and sprayed it with bleach before picking up? So I'm I'm maintaining that integrity in the transport chain there. Then when I bring it in, I'm making sure I'm storing it in conditions. Um, if the pathogen isn't there, it's not going to arise spontaneously in conditions. But as an example, is my storage area rodent proof? And so am I preventing rodents from coming in and potentially uh, um, uh, introducing a pathogen there. Now, as soon as I take that seed that has been really, really well secured to a certain point, at some point I need to open that bag and engage with that seed. And then this gets into hand washing and standard operating procedures and how we handle it to avoid contaminating it. Yet we're still often going through a, a sanitation process like, you know, after all that shit, we're still going to sanitize the seed because that's the kind of world we live in. Um, and it, it's a level of responsibility that you have when you sell food to the public. Um, so you're doing that. Now, on top of that, you know, bigger companies regularly test their product. And so the way we do it is, is we just do it monthly because at our scale, the Canadian Food Inspection Agency on their inspection said, you know, if you're testing monthly and you're seeing low rates or no rates of, of anything, then you're, you're fine. Just try to keep an eye on that. And so that's what we do. We take a cutting of something while it's growing. We seal it up. We keep it cool like we're going to sell it. We take it into the we take it into the. Uh, lab they test it and they they give us the, the results back in you know five to seven days so by that point the, the product is usually on the market and if something came back as a red flag we would do a recall now bigger seed companies um just bringing in more seed bigger operations can be at higher risk of of pathogen introduction and i know of one microgreens company that tests every lot mid-growth they get 24 hour return on their results and they do not sell that crop. It does not leave their facility unless that test comes back positive or negative. Sorry, it comes back without anything on it. If it comes back positive, I'm pretty sure they have to destroy that crop and start again. So different scales have different protocol in place and some of them are, are, are hold and release. You test and you do not release that product until it has been shown to be pathogen free. So by then, like that's a company that's gone and they're probably even doing more steps in between. They're going through five to 10 different steps to ensure the product is getting to market pathogen free. Now, that might seem a little excessive, but we have seen in sprouts and microgreens multiple outbreaks over many, many years, once again, because the conditions for growing these crops is very like the conditions that are optimal for, for um, pathogen growth, that if the pathogen is present, it, there's a good chance it's going to thrive. So these are precautionary measures to take uh, that companies do to reduce their level of liability and to protect, protect consumers that are uh, buying that product. Yeah, it makes a lot of sense. And I, I think six months ago, or well, probably eight months ago, it would have sounded a little crazier, but after the whole COVID-19 pandemic, I think we're all now, you know, hand-washed, sanitized, hand sanitizer, spraying everything, not to insinuate that COVID is, or coronavirus is patched by microgreens, but I think we're all much more aware now of sanitation and the importance of that when it comes to the transfer of pathogens. So with seeds, I think that makes a lot of sense. Why take the risk? After all, a lot of times it's your business, and if somebody complains what's going down it's you and you know your career your livelihood and that's not something i would ever personally want to deal with thinking also of, of covid19 and the effects that it's had on the growing world early on we saw a lot of seed suppliers go into just kind of a lockup like ultra demand go out of stock you know take forever to ship stuff out We'll get more of a macro view on what it was like from Lisa and what it's going to look like into the future with Lisa. But what are your thoughts living through this whole COVID situation as somebody who's intimately involved with the microgreen community and the seed community? Yeah, so there's um, 
this is super intriguing from a seed perspective. Um, so number one, talking to seed uh, company owners and, and, and folks um, over this, this is something that a lot of seed companies experienced in 2008 when the market was crashing, seed sales went through the roof. They were seeing record sales and, and for them it was great. The next year, sales just went back to normal. Everything sort of petered out, that paranoia kind of subsided and, and things were back to normal. This is a bit of a unique situation and, and I really don't know how it's gonna play out, but there's a couple things to consider. One is I am seeing uh, on the forums, companies are like, yeah, we can't get this seed because so many people have bought it up. And I can guarantee you, uh, you know, I'm just going to be irresponsible and say 30 to 40 percent of that seed that got bought up is not going to get used. People stockpile things just in case people make purchases because they're paranoid because they can. What's a couple extra hundred bucks just in case a couple hundred dollars in seed is thousands and thousands of calories. So it's it's, it's a good investment just in case. Um, so. We could see that there's a lot of people that have this seed on stock, in stock and seed sales go down next year because everybody's got their seeds next year because they bought them this year. The other thing is um, uh, seed markets continue to, to be um, stretched because this COVID situation continues to go on. We start to see hits, and it's happened in a few places. Uh, some of the Mexican migrant workers that came into Canada, a group of them got hit by COVID while in isolation. Um, we could see labor shortages if, if there's uh, you know outbreaks again on farms. So there's possibilities of disruptions to the supply chain. You know, around the world, people are adapting really well. People are taking these basic measures like wearing a mask and washing their hands, uh, which may or may not help, but are precautionary measures you take just in case. And and, and I think it's it's great, um, but it's hard to know what the future is going to look like. And and I think it could, could go either way. Seed companies next year would be like, ah, yeah, like the crops that did really well last year are not selling this year because people already have that seed or there's going to be continued uh, worry because, yeah, maybe we see another wave as we get into the cooler season again and people get lax and we see another wave, a third or fourth wave of, of infections coming on. It's really hard to know. Yeah, it'll be interesting to hear what Lisa says, because I think this is uh, running a retail business. This is a nightmare yet kind of a dream scenario, this weird collect, you know, combination of both for a retailer is you have all this demand. So I'm thinking in my head, OK, what do we do when we catch up with the demand? Is the demand going to continue, meaning we have to up our inventory, we have to buy more? But is this demand a blip or is it going to be sustained? So if we want to stay aggressive and up our inventory and this is just a blip, now we're we've way overshot when the market corrects and we're long all this and maybe now we have to lower prices just to get rid of it because seed is it's relatively shelf stable, but it does have a life tied to it. On the other hand, you just order as normal and then be prepared to deal with the customer service nightmare and out of stock issues and leaving potential sales on the table if the situation does continue, if growing demand stays strong and if supplies stay short. Because the other thing is seeds, you know, they're working like a season ahead or a year ahead because seed can't be produced now if I need it now, like it's coming out of a factory, growers have to grow it. It has to make its way to me after it's been processed. How are those growers operating? How have they been affected by COVID? And what does that do with the supply kind of on the, the production end of things? So I don't envy the position that companies like Johnny's and High Mowing or Mums are in to try and say like, where do we go from here? Is this the new normal? Or is this just a blip and how do we adjust? Because you can either leave a lot of money on the table or way overbuy, and neither one is great, but I guess you don't want to overbuy and spend all that money and, you know, have to blow it out to recoup it. Yeah, there, there's a, and I think this is the art of business, right? This isn't the unique, this isn't like the first time this thing happens. This happens all the time for businesses, right? You're always trying to make these decisions, you know, um, 
you know, somebody's like, oh, yeah, let's produce face masks, right? Let's do this. And then by the time you get your design done and your production ramped up, oh, no, fa nobody needs face masks anymore. <laughs> so, so, you know, and there's there's all these sort of potentials there. And um, like as an example, like we just put some and this is this is, a, is conjecture on my part, but we bought some vinyl sheeting for our for our back patio at our new place. And everywhere was sold out of vinyl sheeting. I'm like, huh. You know, so maybe there's only one or two companies doing vinyl sheeting, selling to Home Depot and these companies. They they shut down for whatever reason, or they or they screwed up in their protocols and they had to shut down and they can't get caught up. And so, like, if you're a flooring installer, all of a sudden your your, your supply is disrupted. And you're like, okay, do we cancel these contracts? Do we? What do we do? Like, there's there's all these examples of that and. Yeah, the, the risk is, yeah, you know, you buy that stuff off of the seed company, your sales are great because you're, uh, you've been, you've got, you've sold all your seed. So you've got that money to stock up. But then if you get stuck with that stock, do you have to blow it out at, at, at wholesale prices? Um, this comes into the more the art. It's like, okay, we're going to take that chance because, well, we can, we can, we can do X, Y, and Z. These are some things we can do to push sales a little bit. We spend a bit more in marketing. We offer some specials. We push into markets we don't usually do. Um, and then it's also we're going to up our seed storage. We're, we're going to drop the temperature in our seed storage facility by three degrees Celsius. And we're going to gain six months of storage just because of that, you know, so we're going to pay a little more for that. So you, it's one of those things where storage is an issue and you can actually increase your storage uh, by, by, um, by, by making changes like that. We're going to lower humidity. We're going to, we're going to do these things. So yeah, it, it's once again, that's where your experience as a supplier and a warehouse manager uh, really come in. Yeah, and really storing seeds is a totally interesting process. And over the summer, I interviewed somebody from the Arctic Seed Vault over in Svalbard, Norway, and just heard all about that, and it was fascinating. So I, I think there are things suppliers can do, but you can't necessarily replicate those things on the grower's end. So if if you're a large commercial grower, meaning you're making your living growing microgreens, and let's say you've already gotten creative, thought outside the box, and you navigated restaurants shutting down because restaurants or restaurants slowing down is probably the better thing because they've obviously been a big outlet for a lot of microgreen growers in the past, and you're still thriving, you're still surviving, and you're producing. What would you do thinking that if we go back into winter, COVID hits again, I need to have seed going because one, I mean, we saw a local demand for just produce go through the roof. Some grocery stores were buying up more stuff and the restaurants that stayed in business have been buying some things. If I'm a microgreen grower, I'm not sure I want to go into winter without having a supply locked up in hand in my control, which might mean overbuying, which might mean spending more than I normally would just to know that I have it and I'm not waiting in a long queue if the sugar hits the fan. So what would you be doing? This is probably going to air sometime in October time frame. Thinking ahead, how would you approach this? Um, for the, I've, never, I've never heard he hearing the sugar hit the fan. That was very uh, kid-friendly. I like that. Um, so this is one of those things which is almost like the tragedy of the common everybody's buying up seed, so I better buy up seed or I'm going to get left out. There's that perspective for sure. Um, I'm not doing commercial production right now, but I did buy a bit more seed for my home production. And I didn't buy a lot more because I'm mindful about the bigger picture. I could have, you know, I could have bought and stored maybe 20, 30 kilograms of sunflower and, you know, another 25 kilograms of wheatgrass, but I didn't. I just bought a little more than I usually do, just in case. And, and I'm also kind of hoping that my long-standing relationship was with some seed companies might might get me through the queue a little quicker. Um, so, but as a as a microgreens company in terms of seed, this is something I've talked about before. Like, you don't wait until you're at your last bag of seed to buy more. You should already be thinking about this stuff all the time. You should always have a six-month supply on hand. And that way, when you get down to things, um, you, you know you're 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 buying for you're buying for six months from now. You're buying for a year from now, because without seed, you don't have a business. So this is something I've always pushed. Now, in this case, let's say I buy seed by the pallet load. 
I might say, you know, we're going to buy our regular pallet load. We're going to buy a little bit more because we expect business to go up. And we're going to buy a little bit more because just in case. But we're not going to stockpile it because that's just that's just not very cooperative. And, and to be fair, it's probably something we don't have the money for. Like we can't buy double the amount of seed because we don't have that cash available. We buy seed as the cash is available. We use up that seed. We, we build up our cash reserves. We make another big purchase, and it's it's a great cycle. And we can do that without using any credit. Um, so, so it works well. So it might be that we just have no choice but to buy limited amount of seeds because we don't have that money. Uh, otherwise, we're maybe borrowing that money to buy, to buy more seed, which is a possibility. Um, another thing I might be thinking about is I buy up a lot of seed, and I see there was all those orders and things were behind, but the market's recovering. And, and I've talked to my suppliers like, yeah, things are back to normal. It was a peak, but yeah, you know, that actually we just sold the same amount. We just sold it in a shorter period of time. And now our, our next lot is in like it regular would be and, and seed sales are a little more than usual, but not enough. So you're probably fine. And so I'm sitting on all this seed uh, and maybe I'm like, hey, I hear growers are short on seed elsewhere. So I'm selling my seed to others because I do see people out looking for seed that they can't find because certain seed companies are sold out. So I, I, I try to think about, you know, what is my context in terms of how do I serve my business first and foremost, but keeping in mind that I'm part of a bigger system of growers. And if I'm hoarding all the seed, well, I'm basically screwing everybody else. And eventually everybody else is going to know that it's me who screwed them. And so if I take the perspective of, well, let's, let's, let's see if we can, help people out because we panicked and maybe we bought more than we need. Now we're going to get that seed out to others. So it's a way of sort of, you know, making up for that. So I think there's a lot of different ways uh, to, to play it. And and for some people, yeah, like stocking up on seed may not be an option because you can't afford to do it. And then you get in the situation where the bigger companies are at advantage because like, yeah, we just bought four years of seed. We put it in a freezer. Let's business as usual. We're not, we don't, we're not even thinking about it. Another perspective on that is I know a lot of companies were, um, and this is a bit of a tangent, but related. You know, we've talked to, to a lot of people, we've done some consults, and people like farmers markets and restaurants, and that's where they sell to. And, and the reason they like that is because you're getting a really high end price. And if you're just a microgreens grower, you, you have a lack of diversity of products. And so where you want to diversify is in your markets. And that was the food peddlers model where we did restaurants and grocers and home delivery and, and farmers markets and other people's CSAs because we only had five products, right? And so when you think about food consumption and, and, and restaurants and stuff, you know, people are eating out less and grocers are selling more because the number of calories being consumed overall is about the same, maybe a little less because when there's excess, we probably consume more calories than we need. So it's a pivot. And so for, for a, a grower that's selling to restaurants and grocers, yeah, our restaurant sales went down by 80 percent, but our grocer sales have gone up by 40 percent. And because that market was there, we're already in it. No matter what, food is an absolute. People always need to eat. And you might feel like you're taking a hit on the price when you're selling wholesale, but it's one of those buffers that you make up in volume and you make up in situations like this where those sales go up and other sales go down. Yeah, it'll be really interesting to hear what Lisa says in the upcoming episode about the idea of hoarding seeds. Because I think I have a different take on this. Um, when I think about us selling trays, we've, we've basically been producing trays nonstop since January. I mean, there's been breaks in there, but it's been produce, produce, produce. So as a producer and a retailer, I could say, well, I'm going to limit tray purchases because I want to maintain my inventory. But I look at it as that's a problem I have to solve. Buy as much as you want. I'll solve that problem. On the dairy side of things, at least in the States, you saw companies like the grocery stores and Target saying you can only buy like two milk products. Then you go to dairy farms and you have them just emptying big tanks into the grass. And they're basically saying, no, just keep buying dairy, buy more. Don't put limits on it. But you had the transportation sector, which was really tied up and had to adjust. And I think stores were limiting purchases because 
they didn't want to deal with the backlash of being out of stock and it was kind of like saving face publicly when it really wasn't a supply side of things. There was enough milk to go around. It was just having trouble getting from the where it was produced ultimately to the store shelf. And I wonder if the same thing is true with seeds. Are there seed producers out there that are like, we're sitting on mountains of seeds. It's in storage. Buy all the seed you want. It's just the retailers, essentially the middlemen, and maybe it's the distributors, maybe it's the Johnnies, the mums that were so caught off guard. And, I, and this is no way a bad thing or like an accusation, but maybe they couldn't just handle the volume that it came in so fast. And it wasn't necessarily of we don't have the supply. It was we can't process your volume of orders quick enough. We can always order more. There's more sitting on the shelf at the distributor, at the grower. So I'm curious to know what it was actually like on the seed side of things. Was there a legit shortage when it came to supply or was it more the suppliers having trouble handling demand? And it appeared as though there was a seed shortage, but it was really just an order processing challenge, not an actual seed shortage. Yeah, well, that was definitely the case with a lot of companies is they just couldn't keep up with the orders. You can only pack so many seeds and put them in envelopes and send them off. Um, I think that's a very great insight you've got. It's like, yeah, like it might have just been like we're too busy packing seeds to order more seeds from our supplier to, to, to repack for you. Um, definitely. Um, there's a few things like. Technically, seeds have a shelf life, but there, it's a few years, whereas milk is doesn't have a shelf life unless you're turning it into cheese or yogurt, which extends it. So you've got this cycle that's a little everything's in cycles and they're, and they're shorter when you're dealing with, you know, plastics. Yeah, like plastic is stable. You, you, you make it when you need to make make it. And, and it's it's a little simpler, though, I'm sure has its complications. Um. So I think that's a possibility. Yeah, like maybe like, yeah, we've we've got seeds. We always have more seeds than we need because that's the only way the system works. And we don't want to throw seeds away, but it just that's you actually generally you have to produce more seed than you can sell anyways because you want to just keep the best seed. And so, yeah, that would be another great insight to hear from moms. It's like, oh, yeah, we always had a lot of seed available. We just, you know, we just couldn't pack it up uh, quick enough to get it out to people. I think it's a I think it's a great point. So I'm really curious about that. I'm really curious about how they're planning for COVID. Looking forward to next episode. Is there one thing that you're really curious to ask Lisa about? Uh, I'm really curious about um, this, like how Mums as a company has dealt with this. I'm also curious on another level of, you know, I've talked a lot about my relationship with Mums, and I've got that relationship with some folks at High Mowing and other companies. And it's like I'm I'm curious about what their relationship is like with, you know, the you know buying from the commodity markets or brokers they deal with or farmers that they contract stuff out to. And what that's like for them, and those relationships are going to be decades old, that ensures they have a constant supply. Because one of the reasons companies often have a constant supply is because they're good at what they do. They treat all the customers they work with really well. People want to supply them because they just they, they appreciate the way they do things. Um, I don't know if that's the case, but they, they're a company that's been around for a long time. And often it's those relationships uh, that you build that allow that. So I'm really curious about that because those relationship pieces, I think, are really, really important. Yeah, so people can hear more about Lisa Mum's take from Mum's Organic Seeds coming up next episode. Tune back in for that.